This is a demonstration of the fetch and increment cycle recently implemented on the controller and sequencer cards. And I'm sure as you can tell with the excitement in my monotonous voice that this is a bit of a milestone for the computer because now it's going to be able to run a series of instructions in memory without any further input from the user. Now just as a memory jogger, here's what we're trying to achieve. The fetch part is effectively selecting the program counter onto the memory bus and then reading whatever's in memory onto the data bus. Once we've got that, we want to load the instruction register with that value, and that then gives us the instruction we need to execute. Now bear in mind, while we've got the program counter gated to the address bus, that means the increment is going to be adding one to that value. So now's a good time to load the increment to register. The final step then is just to select that increment to register back onto the address bus and load the program counter from it. And that leaves us with the program counter pointing to the next instruction, ready for when this one's completed. Now if we go for a more complete example, here's one that has the fetch and increment cycle followed by an ALU instruction. Now it's worth noting here that the selecting of the incrementer and the loading of the program counter actually happens the same time as the ALU function is carried out. And that's okay here because the incrementer program counter using the address bus whereas the ALU function is using the data bus. Now if we had an instruction that needed the address bus, we'd have to wait until that increment's finished first. Now on the right of this diagram are the pulses, pulses A, B, C, D and E. Now so far the sequencer is producing C, D and E, so we've got a bit of work to do to add the new pulses A and B. And that's what we'll take a look at now. So you're currently looking at the sequencer cards, and the upper card is on the left, and the lower card is on the right. As you can see, there's not a great deal on the upper card, so let's take a bit of a closer look at the lower card. And we'll start with the LEDs. Previously on this card, we've got the nine stages of the finite state machine shown on the bottom left. Above that is the abort 8 LED, which is lit whenever it's an 8 cycle instruction, which so far all our instructions are. Over to the right, you can find the three derived pulses which come off the finite state machine. Pulses C, D and E. To these, we add the new pulses A and B. Right, let me try and show you how all these LEDs relate to each other through the cunning use of a diagram, perhaps. On the left, it shows the steps that the finite state machine goes through, top to bottom. And this is what you'd see on the LEDs at the bottom left of the card as the clock is advancing the finite state machine. Now, if you look to the right of those LEDs in the diagram, you can see the timing signals that come out of the finite state machine. Now, if you focus on stage one, which is actually the second row of the diagram, you can see there's two timing signals, S1, an S1 dash. The LED that you see at the left is effectively tied directly to the S1 dash, so is only lit at stage 1. And this follows through for all the other stages, so S2 dash, S3 dash, S4 dash, and so on. Each one, the LED is only lit at that stage. Going back up to stage 1 again, you can see there's also an S1, and that lasts twice as long as S1 dash. In fact, S1 actually lasts for the duration of S1 dash as well as S2 dash. And the pattern continues for S2, S3 and so on. So we've got our timing signals, so now we can look to combine them to make some derived pulses. And it's now where if we look at the third part of the diagram, you can see pulses C, D and E. Now for pulses C and D, they're quite straightforward. Pulse C is just S5 and pulse D is just S5 dash. Pulse E is a little bit more complicated, and actually this is a combination of S4 and S5, and what this gives us is a pulse that lasts three beats rather than the two beats of C and the one beat of D. It's these derived pulses that the controller uses to fire the control lines at the right time. The final part of the diagram shows what the pulse LEDs look like at the bottom right of the card, and again you can see pulses E, C and D on at the appropriate times given the finite state machine stages at the left. So let's add those new pulses A and B. As you can see pulse B is just coming straight off of S2 dash but pulse A again is one of these three beaters where it's S1 combined with S2. Those new pulses need some LEDs so let's introduce those now. So there we go. Um, hopefully that wasn't too long-winded, but uh, gives you a bit of a feel for how the sequencer is working. Right then, let's get back to that lower card. 
And so in the middle here, we have the finite state machine for eight cycle instructions. Now I've covered this before in previous videos and nothing's actually changed this time. But briefly, the clock divider is at the top left, which takes the clock and basically divides it in two, which has been demonstrated for you now by this lovely GIF. And the clock divider feeds into the eight stage ring counter below. Finally, it's topped off with a relay at the top right, which handles the abort eight line. So there's no new additional relays here. All we've done is just tapped off the signals that require from the eight stage ring counter. So because this is a pair of cards, we need to think about those card interconnects. And here they are. The signals we had before are the abort eight and the pulses C, D and E. And to these, we add pulses A and B. If we head off to the top of the card now, we can find the usual card backplane connectors. For this lower card, we're pulling through the three control buses X, Y and Z. Now that's not quite enough for what we need, so we need to bring in the upper card, which then has the other connectors. And from left to right, these are power, control and instruction bus, operation bus, and then finally pulse bus, which will send the pulses off to the controller. Right, so that's pretty much it for the sequencer. Let's get those cards stacked together, put in the computer and given a whirl. So let's start with priming the sequencer. And what I'll do is I'll manually clock through, but keep your eyes here and here. Can you see those pulses going through? All right, let me give you a bit of a close up. So I'd say that's looking like it's all working as it should do, uh, so that's enough of that. And let's go and take a look at what's changed on the controller. So again we've got the upper card on the left and the lower card on the right, and just as before we've got the set AB, AOU and move 8 instruction groups, and it's the relays in each of those groups that takes the pulses coming in from the sequencer and operates the correct lines at the right time. So the fetch and increment cycle can be thought of a bit like an instruction and therefore it needs its own group of relays. The difference here being though is that the fetch and increments group of relays will operate on every instruction, not just on a specific type of instruction as the set AB, ALU and move 8 do. They're all driven by the decoder card. Now for some reason I didn't bother putting the relays in the card before photographing it, but rest assured the card really does have those four relays in because it won't work very well without them. Right then, let's take a quick look at those LEDs at the front of the lower card and see what's changed down there. So here's the before state, and here's what it looks like after the changes. And we've added the load instruction register, load incrementer, load PC, and then the select incrementer and select PC. And that's not particularly surprising because we need all those lines as part of the fetch and increment cycle. Now that's not all the lines we need though, so let's bring in the upper card and take a look at its LEDs. So again, here's the before and here's the after. And all we've added is the memory read line. And that now gives us all the control lines we need for the fetch and increment. So just as we did for the sequence of cards, let's now turn our attention to those card interconnects because they'll have changed as well. So here's all the existing lines that go between the cards and here's the ones we've needed to add to get the fetch and increment working. And of course, as always, each one of these individual lines has its equivalent on the upper card. So the last thing then to take a look at here is the backplane connectors at the top of the card. Here they are. And these are just the same as they were for the sequencer upper card, power, control and instruction bus, operation bus, and finally the pulse bus. And there's no surprises for guessing that the lower card is also just the same as the sequencer with the three control buses, namely X, Y and Z. So in theory then, we've got everything we need to run instructions through the computer. 
So let's give it a whirl. Let's see if it actually works. And I'm going to use the same simple program that I used in my last video. And just as a recap, this will take 2 and 4 and add them together to get 6, putting the result into the A register. So the first job then is to load this program into memory, which I need to do by hand. That's the first instruction in, so now I increment the program counter. And I can move on to the next instruction. I can then just repeat the process for the remaining two instructions. Now I'm going to load one final instruction in, which is all the bits set on. And that will confuse the hell out of the sequencer, effectively just making it stop. OK, let's just read that program back, just make sure it's gone in OK. That all looks good. Right, so the moment of truth. Let's prime the sequencer and set the clock going. And slowly to begin with. And there we go, success. The sequence is all locked up and we've got a value of 6 in register A. OK, so that was running at a clock speed of half a hertz, effectively one tick per second. So let's uh, speed that up to one hertz, two ticks per second. OK then, let's give it a go at 2 hertz, 4 ticks per second. Now what you can't see is me just off screen fiddling with the auxiliary clock in the top of the computer and the auxiliary clock is something I'll cover in a future blog post. OK, well that's all going really well. Let's uh, try spicing things up a little. Let's add a few more lines to this program. And all this will do is just increment the value by 1 to get 7. To do this, I'll load address 4 into the program counter. Now this should contain the so-called confusing instruction that has all the bits set. And so all we've got to do is just replace that with that move A to B instruction. With that done, we can then just advance the program counter and put in the next increment instruction. And as before, we'll just need to finish off with an instruction that has all bits set, just to stop the computer just trotting through all the memory and just running everything it can find. OK, let's read the whole program back, just make sure it's in OK.
Splendid. Okay, then let's give that program a run. Perfect. Value of seven in register A. OK, then let's increase the clock speed again. Now we've got a bit of a longer program. Let's go for 4 hertz. And that's going to give you 8 ticks per second. And effectively, each tick is one stage of the sequencer. OK then, let's double up again. Let's go for 8 hertz, which is going to give you 16 ticks per second. Oh, that was still working, so let's double up again and go for 16 hertz with 32 ticks per second. OK, we'll double up once more, up to 32 hertz with 64 ticks per second, but this is about as far as I'd expect the computer to go. Yeah, you see, what's happened here is I've got really excited and just kept the computer running through the next bit of memory. There you go, I've just realised. And that's basically why that all bit set instruction is needed to just pause that sequence and stop it doing that. Never mind, resetting the program counter gets us back to instruction zero, and off we go again. And there we go, a working computer. Quick, let's turn it off before it breaks. But before I go, I did want to just give a quick shout out to all you subscribers out there. Uh, I've just realised I've just gone over 100, which I'm very pleased about, and uh, never thought that many people would be interested in what I'm doing, so it's always a nice little treat. And I guess this video now leaves a question of what's next. Well, as you can see, throughout the video, it's been a bit of a pain entering the program into memory and then sort of checking it's been entered OK. And so it's time to get those little switches on the front uh, operating so I can just uh, enter programs a lot quicker. So that's coming soon. I'm also planning to post a video soon about the instruction set the computer uses, so that's something to keep an eye out for. And then once both of those things are done, I'll post an update video, which will just give an overview of the whole computer and demonstrate a larger program running, uh, just as I did a few years ago. So as always, you can find more information at my blog, relaycomputer.blogspot.co.uk. And please do like, comment and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.